Juan Carlos Zarate, let's talk about the terrorism aspect of this. We uh, have heard a lot today about the no-fly list and the watch list and tides and all of these other uh, uh, protections which are supposed to be in place. Uh, explain them to us and why wasn't he on any list that would have flat, put a red flag by his name? Sure, Gwen. I think the list discussion underscores the importance of intelligence on the front end. I think your other guests are absolutely right. You've got to have the right layered defense and technologies to detect potential bombs and other materials <laughs> used. But the, the reality is, and if it's not planes, it's trains, it's limousines, they're going to find other ways to detonate devices and to attack us. And so the, the fundamental point here, I think, is we have to have the right intelligence that allows us to point to the right individuals that we are uh, need to focus on. The problem we have here is that we had an individual who was notified to us by his father in Nigeria, a prominent banker, notified the U.S. Embassy, which is a little bit unusual. He didn't just go to his local authorities. He went to the U.S. Embassy to tell us that he was, was concerned about his son. But the problem is there wasn't enough information yet about the individual to put him on the more restrictive no-fly list or selectee list which allows the U.S. in concert with airlines to bar individuals from traveling on airlines to the U.S. What would so he was part of a broader database, but there wasn't enough information as of the point of his uh, embarkation to allow authorities to not uh, let him on the flight. What kind of information would you have needed in order to get bumped up from a mere watch list to a don't get let him on this plane list? Well, all authorities had, at least at the point where he was put on what's known as the TIDE list. This is the Terrorist Identities Data Mart environment. The, the initials don't matter, but, but what's important is he was put into sort of this broad database, over 500 names in that database. What you need to get on the no-fly list is more information about a threat from the individuals, known terrorist ties, known to be operational, perhaps known to have had training or contact with al-Qaeda, some of that was not known, and I think one of the questions that will come up in this review is whether or not more should have been done to understand this individual's contacts in Yemen, in Nigeria, in London uh, before uh, he got onto this flight. So that's uh, hindsight's 2020, though. This is very difficult. People need to remember we have get thousands of pieces of data uh, from walk-ins and other sources all the time. And it's very difficult to triage here without more information. I just want to correct one little thing. It's 500,000 people on that list. That's what you meant to say. But oh, I also, 500, 000, right. that's but right. I want to ask you about Yemen, because now we see this afternoon the government of Yemen has said, yes, he traveled to our country. And we have heard that the al-Qaeda, this offshoot of al-Qaeda based apparently in Yemen, has claimed responsibility. How much of a problem or a threat or a worry is Yemen and as a training ground for people like this? This is a huge concern, Gwen. Uh, Yemen has been on the radar screen for counterterrorism officials for some time as a potential new safe haven for al-Qaeda operatives. We know that al-Qaeda has some high-level individuals who have set up shop there with compounds and training. Uh, in general, they have been local in their focus, attacking terrorist sites, taking hostages, attacking Yemenis. Uh, but now I think the worst nightmare has emerged, which is uh, a platform other than Pakistan and Afghanistan serving as uh, sort of a lily pad from which al-Qaeda can then try to attack the U.S. And I think this now is kind of the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back because we've had other concerns and incidents with respect to Yemen, but I think this is the one that's going to garner the attention of U.S. officials more than any to date, and I think we're going to see more intensive focus on Yemen as we've seen over the last couple of weeks with raids and in Yemen against al-Qaeda safe houses and compounds. I want to ask each of you briefly if you can give us a sense tonight, speak, starting with you, Larry Johnson, how frayed is our safety security net right now? How, how, how frayed, frayed is it? Uh, it's got some gaps that haven't been closed, but we've known about them for almost 20 years. So the point is we've made some improvements since 9-11, but there's still some significant areas of, uh, of gaps that we need to close. Douglas Laird, how frayed? One of the things that uh, Juan Carlos said caught my attention, that was that uh, when I was at Northwest, we designed a program called CAPS, uh, Computer Assisted Pre-Passenger Screening. That program was mandated by the FAA to all U.S. flag carriers. On 9-11, the, the CAPS program we developed at uh, Northwest identified 10 of the 19 hijackers. This is on 9-11. What failed on 9-11 were the FAA policies and procedures of how to deal with those selectees. I have heard that uh, since 
the TSA has abandoned the CAPS program. If that's the case, somebody should also investigate why. And you believe that that's a hole in the safety net as well? Oh, sure. Juan Carlos Zarate, where do you see the holes in the safety net if they exist? Gwen, Gwen, I think a major issue that still remains, it was an issue during the Bush administration, I think the Obama administration will confront this, is the variety of databases that we have with respect to suspect individuals. There are still restrictions based on U.S. law, very important restrictions, on the blending of some of that data. And so uh, there are dots out there that aren't initially connected in part because of civil liberties and civil rights concerns. Again, legitimate. But I think we're going to confront a time when we're going to have to come to grips with the, the inclusion of that information. And we're also going to have to come to grips with the fact that biometrics at the end of the day will be a much more effective way of screening individuals than a name-based system. Fortunately, in this case, he used his name. Uh, but that doesn't preclude somebody from using an alias or a false passport. Uh, and I think that's something we're going to have to come to grips with. You think security eventually will, tr will trump privacy on this? Well, I think we, we've seen pendular swings. Recall, Gwen, that over the last three years, there's been a, a hue and, and cry in terms of removing names off the list. A huge amount of pressure from Congress, for example, to take and reduce the list on the no-fly and selectee list. And so now I think you're seeing the pendular swing, swing the other way, uh, with people calling for folks on the tide list to be incorporated mm -hmm. onto the no-fly list. Uh, there are real costs to that on, in terms of commercial travel, but also in terms of civil liberties and civil rights. But we've got to find a balance, uh, and we've got to realize that te the terrorists are innovating, they're global, uh, and these threats come from all parts of the world. Juan Carlos Zarate, Douglas Laird, and Larry Johnson, thank you all very much. Thank you.